work extremely hard to get to this point. And I'm from Philadelphia. And only Marvin Harrison can make that catch. I'm very thankful and very gracious that, you know, that this has happened. Meet Robert Nixon, the man who had seen everything. He had seen more than enough to put a rich man with a significant amount of influence behind bars. But this is what you tell the police if you're a fool. Saying the words, I ain't seen nothing, could be the difference between life and death. And this was evident to Robert Nixon as he had witnessed a shooting firsthand. Nixon didn't know the man who was shot when he was still alive, but he had seen him around. More than a year before the murder, Nixon stumbled upon the fat man who was lying dead in the street in front of a water ice stand, getting the crap beaten out of him by Marvin Harrison and a Harrison employee by the name of Stanley McRae. It was done in broad daylight on April 29, 2008, on the corner of 25th Street and Thompson, not exactly the greatest neighborhood in town, and definitely not where you would expect an eight-time Pro Bowl wide receiver who was on the tail end of a $67 million contract to be spending his time there. The fact that Marvin Harrison was there in of itself was extremely sketchy, especially because Harrison had this reputation of being quiet and humble. And here he was, noisily stomping on the eventual murder victim in the face and gut in broad daylight. To Robert Nixon, the man looked semi-conscious. After several minutes, Harrison and McRae would walk away. The fat man would pick himself up and shout expletives and would barely drag himself to his car. Nixon would watch as Marvin Harrison got into his own car, parked to the west of the fat man's. The fat man put his car into reverse, which is terrifying because the street they were on, which was Thompson Street, was a one-way street going east. So the fat man was clearly terrified because he was going the wrong way on a one-way street in reverse. He kept backing up the wrong way until he would get in front of a car wash that Marvin Harrison owns. The fat man would block Harrison who was trying to drive away. Nixon would watch Harrison get out of his car and exchange words with the fat man. Nixon didn't know what was being said, but he could see the gestures of threat and counter threat. The fat man would stay in his car and called somebody on his cell. Harrison would get back into his car and also would call somebody on his own cell phone. After two minutes, Harrison would get out of the car again. Nixon described Marvin Harrison as six feet tall and 185 pounds with a neatly trimmed mustache and the body fat content of an Olympic swimmer. Yeah, sounds about right to me. He would watch Harrison approach the fat man's car with two guns in each hand. Nixon would freeze and say, you ain't gonna shoot, you ain't gonna shoot, do what you gotta do. Harrison would begin shooting a barrage of bullets at the fat man. Nixon was 30 yards away when Harrison began shooting and Nixon would get hit in the crossfire and get hit in the back. Another couple's vehicle would get hit as they were driving with the shards of glass breaking and getting into their two-year-old son's eye. The fat man would only get shot in the hand and would flee immediately. So would Harrison. This wasn't the moment where the fat man would die. But Nixon would still need to get to his car which was parked on Thompson Street. Nixon would sprint towards the scene of the crime before a policeman would stop him, thinking that he was the shooter. After being pat down by the police, the officer began questioning Nixon, and despite having a gunshot wound in his back, Nixon would say the iconic words, I ain't seen nothing, and the officer would move on. Break! The 1996 NFL Draft was an absolutely iconic one. What the draft lacked in quarterbacks and more than made up for in truly transcendent wide receiver talent. It was in this draft class that we would see Keyshawn Johnson drafted number one overall, with Marvin Harrison being drafted at the 19th overall spot and eventually Terrell Owens in the third round. Marvin Harrison and Terrell Owens would constantly be compared throughout their careers, while Terrell Owens was known to be a diva and a player that was consistently in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Marvin Harrison was a player who was quiet. You never heard a word from him. Throughout the entirety of his career, Marvin Harrison would put up eight 1,000 yard seasons and score 128 touchdowns. He would win a Super Bowl in the 2006 season before quietly retiring in 2009. 
Harrison was a model citizen throughout his career for the Indianapolis Colts on the gridiron and would win three first team all pros and would lead the league in receiving yards and touchdowns throughout various portions of his career. What's terrifying about the story is how a man so quiet who is considered to be a model citizen could be so deeply involved with a murder mystery. Now before we get to the content guys, please take a moment to leave a like, subscribe, and turn on my notifications. This video took a very long time to produce, and the one second it takes you to leave a like and subscribe goes a very long way in my ability to grow this channel. Furthermore, I live stream my Madden simulation from year 2002 to 2020 on Twitch on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 9pm Pacific time. And finally, if you enjoy this type of new content, please take a moment to comment any other stories that you would like us to cover on the channel. I know we're dancing on a thin line of controversy here, but we're going to do our absolute best to navigate through these waters. And a huge shout out to Jason Fagone for his piece in 2010 on this story for GQ magazine. Marvin Harrison was a worker, the guy that never wore his gloves in practice because the gloves were sticky and made catching balls easy. He wanted to practice the hard way. He was a neat freak who was an absolute perfectionist which meant that he easily got along with his fellow perfectionist quarterback, Peyton Manning. Think about how disciplined one must be to make a living as an elite star of a multi-billion dollar entertainment juggernaut known as the NFL. Marvin Harrison had a large and close family. Some of his family members have been violent criminals and his inner circle struggled to protect him from those bad influences. His uncle was a respected anesthesiologist at Temple University and his mother and stepfather were modest business people who worked hard and fed needy families when they could. Marvin would ultimately implement these values and use his platform to give back to his community, donating 88 turkey dinners to the poor of North Philly in Thanksgiving of 2006. This also taught Marvin the value of family above everything, and certainly over money. Marvin would prove this to all of us by buying his mother a 4 bedroom, 5 bathroom, 7,600 square foot home, and other than that, he was extremely conservative with his money. Even his investment strategy favored low risk mutual funds. You wouldn't dare catch Marvin Harrison sipping on an overpriced Starbucks latte, and he didn't have a ton of real estate apart from a few investment properties that he snatched up at extremely low prices. But if you dig deep, Harrison appeared to be your average millionaire athlete. And on the street level, he was a savvy businessman cobbling together a mini empire in the hood. It was a way to reinvest his money into his roots, which is a tough thing for any athlete that went from absolute poverty into wealth. Many athletes in Harrison's situation would migrate to suburban mansions, whereas others like Allen Iverson would go the other way. Marvin didn't run and he didn't flaunt, he just hid, his life was controlled an extraordinary man's attempt to become a ghost in his own story. For a while it actually worked. And then for reasons that go well beyond Marvin Harrison, reasons having to do with race, class, and politics, it didn't. F**k you said the fat man, f**k the bar and I'll f**k you up. It was mid-April of 2008, two weeks before the shooting. The fat man, aka Dwight Dixon, aged 32, was standing with a friend at the front door of Playmakers, Marvin Harrison's bar demanding to be let inside. Playmakers is about half a mile southwest of 25th and Thompson on a side street of a gentrifying neighborhood. A block to the east is North Star Bar where you can see some indie bands perform. From the press coverage of the Harrison case, you'd think that Playmakers was some kind of ghetto shithole. But once you get past the bouncers and their pat downs, you find yourself in a nice warm upscale black bar. There are two pool tables and an old school Galaga arcade console. The walls are covered with framed jerseys of Donovan McNabb and Jerry Rice and photographs of Charles Barkley. But there's no Harrison jersey, no Harrison photos, because who needs the memorabilia when you've got the man himself? Odds are good that if you go to Playmakers on a weekend, you'll see Marvin Harrison adjusting the thermostat, checking the taps, and peering out the front door. Or if you're Dwight Dixon, you get to watch him pat you down and pat your friend down and lay a hand on something gun-shaped and concealed on your friend's person and tell you both to get lost. Dixon was extremely fat, so fat that people would call him Pop and for the sake of authenticity, we're also gonna call him Pop. Pop was not welcome at Playmakers. Harrison made it clear that night in April and Pop was not the sort of person to let this insult slide. One of Pop's cousins would call him a straight up hustler like he didn't take any handouts and he was a very proud person. 
Pop saw himself as Marvin Harrison's equal because they had both grown up in the same North Philly neighborhood. They knew each other as kids, and they'd both been born in the city's worst modern hour, when it was grimy and vegetal, when it stank, when gangs ruled the neighborhoods, when the old industries were dying and the white ethnics were hightailing to the suburbs, when the notorious black mafia was flooding the streets with heroin of unprecedented potency, and the newly elected mayor was a skull-cracking cop who promised to be so tough on crime they had both chosen to hawk in their products, car washes and liquor for Marvin Harrison, and drugs for Pop. In a part of the city that remained, even in April of 2008, absolutely dark and extremely twisted. If Marvin Harrison had moved on to some better place, then there probably wouldn't have been a conflict to begin with. Pop wanted to leave Philly himself, it was his dream. He would take his girlfriend on vacations every weekend he could, but Harrison would stay and dig deeper and deeper into the fiber of Philadelphia's underbelly. In 1994, Pop had gone to state prison for dealing crack, and by the time he came out, he was a devout Muslim six years later. And guess what? Marvin Harrison was still there. He was a king amongst peasants, distributing small-scale charity beneath the media's radar. His wealth was creating such clout that it warped the hierarchy of his neighborhood. According to Pop, Everyone sucks up to him, and I don't. I'm gonna see you in your place of business, and I'm gonna buy drinks. A week after Pop was banned from Marvin Harrison's bar, Playmakers, he would then be denied a car wash from Marvin Harrison's car wash, then he would go back to the bar again and get denied. Marvin Harrison would say this to the police. I walked down and asked him why he was continually threatening me and coming to my businesses and harassing my employees. He said, I'm a grown man, I can do and go wherever I want and say what I want, and like I said, I will f you up and f your bar up. Now what? He puts his hands up and swung at me. He grazed me on my left shoulder and chin. I swung back and I missed. We wrestled and threw punches a little bit, and I then walked up the street back to my garage. I guess like five minutes later, he backs up the street in front of my car wash, gets on his phone and is saying, get your guns, you know what you're gonna get, Stan McRae, I'm gonna f you up Marv you ain't no gangster I told him that I wasn't a gangster but that he couldn't keep coming back to my place of business and threaten me and start trouble he drove off down the street I was inside the garage and I heard gunshots like right after that after the shooting pop got a ride to Lane Canal Hospital five miles away from the car wash Marvin Harrison owned the cops arrived and asked pop for his name and he would respond with one of his several aliases Malik Tucker he said it was one of his many aliases, Demetrius Bryant, Swite Dixon, Dante Jones, Dwight M. Mobelli. The cops would ask him how he got shot, and Pop would respond that he had been robbed. Soon, the cops at the hospital got a call from the cops back at 25th and Thompson, and there was a red Toyota Tundra full of bullet holes that was being towed there. The person who had called the tow truck was Pop's girlfriend. The cops knew that Pop was lying. They told him he'd better come clean. Pop grinned and told him to f*** off. The mood around Pop's hospital bed was relaxed, jovial. The cops had a professional appreciation for the purity of Pop's BS. You know who shot me, Pop said. Why didn't Pop blurt out the truth? He might have been scared. To be a witness in Philadelphia is no small thing, even if you're a 300 pound drug dealer. In December, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported that 13 witnesses or relatives of witnesses have been murdered in the city since 2001. But there are also two other theories. The most likely one is that Pop lied to the cops because he had shot back at Harrison with a gun of his own, and if this was true, then Pop was potentially on the hook for an attempted murder charge. Same as Harrison. No gun of Pop's had ever been found, but casings were recovered from three types of guns, a 5.7, a 9mm, and a 40 caliber. And two fired 9mm casings were found in the cab of Pop's truck. The second theory is that Pop lied to the cops simply because he didn't want them to get in the way. He might have been planning to resolve the dispute himself in his own fashion. The police would keep Pop in custody overnight to allow him to cool off and rethink his story, and the next day they would plug Marvin Harrison's name and date of birth in a state database of gun licenses, and a long list of guns came up. The cops already knew that some of the casings recovered from the scene of the crime came from this type of gun. 
Later on in that day, a bunch of uniformed officers, including several guys from the state attorney general's gun violence task force, drove to Chucky's garage, which was Marvin Harrison's car wash, in search of the 5-7. Harrison seemed to know that they were coming. He was just hanging out in a cheap aluminum beach chair before a full-sized cardboard cutout of himself, and he looked relaxed. A detective asked him if he was carrying a gun. Marvin Harrison said yes. He would swing his right foot up onto a pool table where he would show off a loaded 32 caliber handgun. The 32 was irrelevant, it had nothing to do with the crime. At this point, a lieutenant disappeared into the car wash's office along with Harrison and Anthony Gilliard, which was Marvin Harrison's stepfather. Gilliard said, Detective, I know what you came for, it's right over here. Gilliard led the detectives to a filing cabinet. In front of the cabinet was a trash bucket, and behind the bucket, lying on the floor, was the 5-7. It too was fully loaded, 19 bullets in the clip, one in the chamber. Harrison still had a number of plausible alibis. Even if the gun hammer were to match the casings that were recovered from the scene of the crime, which, by the way, they eventually would, five of six casings did match, Harrison would still claim that he was acting in self-defense. Marvin Harrison would later on go and answer questions down at the Central Detectives Division for an hour and would admit that his fight with Pop took place five to ten minutes before the shooting. He says that immediately before he heard the gunshots, he was sitting in the doorway of his garage. The detectives asked him if Pop had a gun that day, and Harrison says no. Then Harrison would establish his motive and put himself at the scene of the crime, and then would eliminate any possible self-defense defense, because check this out. Question, when was the last time you or anyone else fired your FN 5.7 caliber handgun? Answer, probably the day I bought it. Question, what day was that? Answer, in 2006 or 2007. Question, where do you store this weapon? Answer, in a safe at my home in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Question, today, did you have it at the car wash? Do you know how it got there? Answer, I brought it in today, 20 minutes before you came. Question, are you saying that the 5.7 caliber handgun that you own was in the safe at your home up until today, when you decided to bring it to your shop in the 2500 block of Thompson Street? Answer, yes. That answer, yes, is very crucial, because get this, Harrison essentially says that the gun hasn't been fired since 2006 or 2007. That's impossible, fresh casings exist, so the gun had to have been fired, but by whom? Harrison says he doesn't know. All he knows is that the gun couldn't have been lent or stolen because it was locked away the entire time in his suburban safe. Only it couldn't have been in the safe either because it had to have made an appearance at the corner of 25th and Thompson. Harrison's story makes absolutely no sense. Three days after the shooting, Robert Nixon would contact the police. It went against his instinct, but he had no choice. According to Nixon, he was scared because he had been contacted by Marvin Harrison's associates. They offered to pay for a surgery, to remove the bullet, and if Nixon stayed away from the police, they might also compensate him. When news broke of the shooting, his voicemail began filling with threats. Things like, you think you slick, we gonna kill you. Nixon was a small time hustler, someone that would deal weed and pills to make a quick buck. He wasn't anything special and he even knew it. And this nobody was getting in between Marvin Harrison and his social stature. There's a few problems wrong with the story. For one, Nixon said that he saw Harrison with two guns, which is what Pop claimed as well. But the spacing of the shells along the street convinced the cops that the shooter had been gripping one gun with two hands on the stock to keep it steady. Overall, Nixon's story seemed incredibly consistent and matched up well with statements from other witnesses. Let's look at the evidence. You have a gun, you have casings, you have ballistic tests, and you have Marvin Harrison's own words. Therefore, you have probable cause for an arrest warrant. But the prosecutors saw this case differently. It was really different to win the case when you are primarily going off of the testimony of a low-end hustler like Pop and the testimony of someone untrustworthy like Nixon. None of the cops doubted for a second that if Harrison was a plumber or a UPS driver instead of a famous athlete, he'd have long since been arrested. In the end, the Philadelphia DA, Lynn Abraham, had a press conference where she questioned the credibility of the witnesses involved. Therefore, the case could not go forward due to multiple, mutually exclusive, inherently untrustworthy, and sometimes false statements by the people present. On July 21st, 2009, according to surveillance video captured from a nearby convenience store, 
Pop emerged from the chopstick and fork and walked to his car. He looked over his shoulder, then got into his car and made a phone call. Three minutes later, a six foot tall man in a black hoodie and white sneakers ran up to the driver's side and shot Pop multiple times through the window. Then the man sprinted around the hood to the passenger side and shot Pop again. The shooter fled. Pop spent the next two months in Hanuman Hospital, a tracheostomy tube jammed into his windpipe, able to only communicate with his family by blinking. He would die on September 4, 2009. According to multiple sources with knowledge of the investigation, the primary suspect in Pop's murder was initially Lonnie Harrison, Marvin's cousin. Acting on a tip, police searched Lonnie's apartment looking for a gun. The apartment was a tiny room above Deborah's kitchen, the soul food restaurant on Gerard run by Marvin's mother and aunt, but Lonnie hadn't been living there for a year. There was no gun or any other evidence to tie him to the murder and no witnesses have ever come forward to identify Lonnie or anyone else as the shooter. On the convenience store video, the shooter's face was obscured by shadow, making a positive identification impossible.